Good afternoon. Yes, my name's Craig Young. I'm the Head of Industry Relations from Chorus. Um, and I don't live in Gisborne. I live in Auckland, unfortunately. But never mind, we're a beautiful town. Um, I'd like to introduce two of my colleagues today. Um, Catherine Andrews from the other Chorus jacket is a business development manager with us. And she's working with your local RSP, Gisborne Net. Oh, sorry. I didn't realise the microphone was being used. Um, which is sad because I like to walk, but never mind. Uh, who's working with your local RSP, Gisborne Net on uh, introducing them to the uh, wide world of selling fixed services. So they're going to get into the fibre world, which is pretty exciting for us and for you guys. And uh, Mike Sheely, who's in the Chorus shirt. He is our Senior Delivery Specialist, who is actually based in um, Napier, but looks after this area as well. So any difficult technical, why are you digging this area, and what about the fibre that runs up this road, and in 1926 you did this, Mike knows there, he did it probably, so um, he'll know the answer to those questions. Whereas I'm in marketing and sales, so you know, what do you expect from this side of the fence, yeah. So uh, thank you for coming. I'd like to, um, hopefully I've made this a little bit interactive this afternoon, because I want to show uh, a little bit more about talk about what our network's going to do, but it's more about, you know, what can you do with it than, than what it's about. So I'll talk a little about who we are and what we're doing, but at the same time I'll try and introduce a little bit more interest because I know listening to me for half an hour probably isn't the most exciting thing uh, that you've come along for. So this is entitled Unlocking the Potential of Fast Internet. Um, so I'd like to show you first something that we did last year that took some young people's um, artwork, digital artwork in New Zealand, and shared it with the world, and we've been sharing that with New Zealanders since last year. So, I'll just run this video. So we made history one afternoon late last year where we took over in one go the largest number of screens in Times Square that anyone had ever done for one show. And for two half hour blocks, one you could see there was in the afternoon and one in the evening, we showed Kiwi uh, artwork up on the screens. We ran a competition before that and uh, a digital art competition and we had 13 winners and we took three over to New York. So they were actually there watching the, uh, the show. And uh, unfortunately, I wasn't the uh, colleague who took them over there, but um, as he uh, keeps reminding us. Um, but I had the uh, fortunate um, task of hosting their families and their colleagues and some of the other artists that we didn't take to New York in, an, in a movie theatre in Auckland on Queen Street, and we had a live feed from Times Square. So we watched for half an hour what was being recorded. 
um, when it first went up. And it was just so exciting to hear young, you know, the artists and their families. When they saw their artwork in Times Square, okay, they were watching it in Auckland, but they just were just blown away and they were just so excited about it. And we did that because we wanted to show that, you know, the world actually was ours and we could actually get into the world and we could take it. And we, um, it, the other interesting thing for me was being at events cinemas in, um, in Auckland. It was the first time that they had actually tried a live feed into their theatre. So we did another first by having a live feed over the internet into one of their movie theatres up on the screen. So pretty exciting stuff, actually. And we're going to make the most of that um, as we can. And you, you, you may have seen that on TV. It's been on TV recently. Showed before The Hobbit, if you watched The Hobbit, if you saw The Hobbit movie. Um, and there are short clips coming, and there's banners on the internet. We also did it because we wanted to talk about, uh, we wanted to shift the conversation. This is a shared journey that we are all going on. And I think as I've listened to speakers, I've heard that sort of conversation. It's not just about chorus laying pipes in the ground and bits of fibre, which we light up. It's about what we can do with it together. It's a journey that we think most New Zealanders support is advancing us into the future. Um, but it's not just about technology. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the research we've done in the last 12 months to sort of flesh that out a little bit about what people are thinking about it. But most importantly for me and in my role is I, and uh, I've put it there as we because I write these things on behalf of Chorus, um, you know, we think this is really important for regional New Zealand. We're building a network in Gisborne that is the same network that we're building in Auckland. It's got the same access to the world as Aucklanders have. It goes at the same speed and it costs the same. The cost, the charge that we charge anybody is exactly the same. So it's not going to matter who you buy it from or, um, or who buys it from us. You know, it could be, doesn't matter if it's uh, Ronald at Gisborne Net or if you buy it from Telecom. You get the same, from our perspective, you've got the same speed and the same service, at the same cost, whether you buy it here or you buy it in Auckland. And I'll talk about the schools in a moment because I think the schools is an awesome story as well. Just for a moment about Chorus, because I still get asked these questions about who we are and are we still Telecom? We're not. We were split from Telecom 15 months ago. We are, uh, as of about three months ago, um, majority owned by New Zealanders. So our share register is now over 50% New Zealand investment funds or New Zealand mother and father investors. So we can truly say we're a New Zealand company. Um, we are the largest telecommunications company in New Zealand. We own the network that runs to your houses and your businesses. There's about 1.8 million connections on our network. Um, and we have about 750 staff now, because we're, we're growing, and mainly out of the old telecom and chorus, but now we're starting to pick up people outside of the organisation and bringing new, fresh people in. And the number I always reel off so we have 2,000 technicians and 1,800 vans around New Zealand. Now that I've mentioned the van, I'm sure that as you leave here today and drive home, you'll see some, because we've got about 20 people in, uh, 20 Downers people who work for us here in uh, Gisborne, and there's probably a good eight or 10 vans driving around the place, and you're bound to see them. They are our biggest moving uh, s you know, screen that we possibly could have. Because you'll, and you've probably had one of our technicians in your house at some stage too to fix your phone service. Hopefully not. Hopefully your phone's been working perfectly. Right. I want to just take a step back for a moment before we dive into the fibre world and just say there are a couple of things I'd like you to, messages that I'd like you to take away today. The first one is we actually do have a world class copper network. I know we talk about it not going very fast and we complain that at four o'clock in the afternoon it slows down when everybody, you know, when the kids get home and they go to do their homework, Facebook, and uh, whatever else they do, all at the same time. Um, but that's just the nature of a copper network. It's not that it's a crap network, it's just the way it's designed. And that's the way all those copper networks are designed. They're a contented network, and they work as they should. In New Zealand, we have a world-class network delivering 10 to 20 megabits per second to about 82% of New Zealanders. That's actually world-class. There are other jurisdictions around the world that are trying to catch up. And in fact, in Australia, they're almost talking about, they've been talking about going fibre to the home. If we get a change in government in Australia, there's a possibility they could step back and go back to implementing what we finished 18 months ago. 
So, you know, that's one of the things I want you to take away is we actually really do have a reasonably decent network now. It operates like it should, it's just not fit for the future. We've got about 1.5 million lines that can get broadband now. We've got about 602 of those really ugly buildings. If you want to know where the telephone exchange is in a town, just look for the ugliest building possible with some aerials on the top and the windows up here so no one can see out them. That's probably our building. Um, and you won't be able to get into them, but I can. So. Um, and 12,000 of those ugly green things. Well, we have little ugly green things and big, nice um, movie, uh, not movie, uh, I think beige is the colour of choice at the moment, those cabinety things on the side of the road. Please don't drive into them. Um, they do keep going if you knock them over, but we do tend to have to replace them. So uh, don't, please try and stay away from them. I think the interesting thing about, I've seen some photos of cabinets in the Christchurch earthquake where you know, the cabinet's hanging half over a hole because the ground's fallen away, and the cabinet just stayed up and just kept running because they've got batteries and all sorts of things on. Let's talk about the future because that's really what we're here for, isn't it? So the future is fibre. Um, there's the second point I want you to take away today. New Zealand actually took global broadband leadership in 2012. And this is with delivering fibre, but not a lot of fibre in that year. The whole conversation and discussion that it drove, drove people to think about broadband and to start buying it and start taking it in their house. So the way you read this chart, the further to the right you are, is the higher your growth was in that year. So our broadband penetration growth in 2012 was the highest of any OECD company, our country. And we are just slightly above the average now for actual penetration. So that's a good news story. The not so good news story on this particular slide is you look at the size of the bubble. The bubble is the size or the number of fibre connections that are delivered as part of broadband. So you've got the biggies. You've got the Koreas, the Japans, and the Scandinavian countries. So the big, big circles. And we know there's a touch screen now. So Korea, big circle, lots of fibre connections. New Zealand, sure we took the leadership and growth, little circle. Um, and it's not to do with population size, it's to do with the percentage of fibre connections. So we've got a huge opportunity as we build the network to grow the number of fibre connections. The interesting thing is look at the size of the USA bubble. I mean, we think of the USA as being at the head of everything, but they're actually they're behind the eight ball when it comes to fibre connectivity. And actually the global financial crisis we've found in discussions has really impacted Europe. And, it, and France is, looks like it's the only country in Europe at the moment that's even considering doing what we're doing, which is delivering fibre to everyone's house, or 75% of New Zealanders' house. So, you know, we really are, and there's, there's your third point, this whole UFB thing is actually world leading, um, in, in particular in the OECD. It won't happen overnight though. We'd like it to, we'd like to drive as many connections onto the fibre network as possible because we think it has so many benefits for New Zealand, but it won't happen. And I put some numbers on here that you can look at. So dial up and broadband took 10 years to reach 50% penetration. Uh, cell phones took 15 years to reach 50% of the population. Uh, pay TV took over 20 years to reach 50% of the population. So, you know, those are the sorts of technology lags we just got to think about. Um, and our job is to try and help, you know, make that uptake time shorter, but recognising that it won't be overnight. I want to play you an advert because I know, you know, I've been talking for a little while. This one, I'll tell you about it afterwards. advert from Hong Kong, Hong Kong Broadband, it's, uh, you know, it's for fibre. 
So the obviously the original pipe was just plain old copper broadband, and the new pipe that they had was the fibre. You know, just showing the trying to put into everyday language what the benefit of fibre was: bigger, wider, faster pipe. And uh, and also was a little bit funny. So at least it gave you something to laugh about. New Zealanders. So right. We did some research last year. We decided that as an organisation, um, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is that Chorus, the way Chorus is set up, we can't, we're actually restricted from selling to end users. So we cannot sell to, uh, you can't ring Chorus and ask to take broadband. You need to ring a service provider, such as Telecom, Vodafone, Gisborne Net, uh, Call Plus, Slingshot, those guys. We sell to them, they sell to you. So we can't sell. So we thought originally that they would do all the, all the work they get out there, they'd advertise, and they tell all of you guys how awesome fibre was and why you should buy it. Didn't really pan out that way. So we thought, well, why don't we do some research and help them out? So we did over a 1,000 surveys and interviews last year, what Colmar Brunton did for us, and we found out some really interesting things, and I'd like to share some of those things with you now because they sort of help us understand what, does New, what do New Zealanders think they'll do with this stuff. What we found out was New Zealanders know about UFB and they believe that's a technological upgrade for the country. But they don't know what it means for them. So they don't know what they're going to do with it. And then we pushed them a little bit further and they said, well, only one in ten customers was actually dissatisfied with their broadband. We were a little bit surprised about that one, you know, because there's a lot of noise about how slow it goes and those sorts of things. So we pushed a little bit further. And what it turns out is that while one in ten said they weren't uh, dissatisfied, 78% of people said, yeah, but I don't like how the speed slows down and sometimes it drops out and it's a bit unreliable, um, particularly businesses. So, you know, there is, there is a real understanding out there that in the network, the broadband's okay, but it's not what they want. But the next question is, what are they going to do with it? So we ask some more questions. Hang on, I, I might just come back to the slide. We wanted to find out, was it a problem with devices? You know, was, or was it, was it a problem? And I know we had the computer and home discussion, so we'll put those 6,000 families aside at the moment. What we found with the majority of places, of homes, or the 1,000, 82% of those homes had a laptop in them. 82%. In fact, the way you read this chart, the 1,000 homes we talked, and we did a random survey, so, you know, it should be reasonably um, statistically uh, sound. One point, there was, on average, 1.4 laptops in these places. Now, I don't know about you, but in our house, we have, I think we have three. We, own, well, we don't own, oh, no, we do own one of them. It belongs to my son. He owns it. The other two are obviously work ones, but, you know, so we obviously skew the uh, stats. But, you know, on average, it's about 1.4 laptops. And the other way you read it is the percentage at the bottom, 97% of those laptops are connected to the internet. The ones that we're watching are the smartphones. 60% of people had smartphones, and even people at prepay have smartphones. Um, and 92% of those are connected to the internet. Um, tablets down here at the bottom, 29% uh, had tablets, 92% of them are connected. Um, the one we're also watching is the smart TV. So... 39% had smart TVs, but only 50% of them were actually connected to the internet. Now, the definition of a smart TV is it's internet capable. Now, my smart TV is connected to the internet, and it's actually, frankly, it's rubbish because the user interface is crap. But you know, when they get that sorted out, it'll be great. But if you buy a Samsung television, a smart Samsung television in New Zealand today, and connect it to the internet, you can watch TVNZ on demand straight off the TV. You don't have to have a laptop or a computer connected to it. If that TV is connected to the internet, TVNZ On Demand is on the screen. So is Netflix, and there are a range, YouTube's on there as well, so there are a range of services starting to come through on the TV. That's important for us because we think most bandwidth in people's houses is going to be on the TV. We talked about Sky and Sky dishes. How many people have a My Sky box? This MySky box actually has an Ethernet port on the back of it already that's not in use. They could, Sky could, to my, uh, if they uh, wanted to, deliver television to that Sky box down the fibre network because their device is already enabled. They just have to buy a service from us to deliver through to the premise, through to the Sky box. 
so they could get away from rain fade forever. <laughs> so um, in the middle of a Warriors game or uh, an all-black game. So that's about, you know, so then we said, okay, in most places it's not an issue of having devices. So why would you take up fibre? So for residential customers, they said the, most, the reason they'd most likely take it up is those two on the left, the speed, 91%, and 72% said reliability. But when you push them a little bit further, it's not about headline speed. It's not about having, you know, numbers don't really mean much to people. If you say to them it's 100 megabits per second, most people go, yeah, but in relation to what? What does that mean? Those of us in the, in the industry sort of know it's 100 times faster than one megabit per second, right? So it's obviously quicker. Bigger the number, the quicker it goes. But what does that really mean? So most people, when you talk to them, they go, what I want is the speed that I paid for consistently. I don't want it to drop off. I want it reliable. When I want it, I want it. So if I buy 30 megabits per second, which is the lowest fibre product, I want 30 megabits per second all day, every day, and I don't want it to drop. That's what we found out when we talked to people. So we want to start changing the conversation at our base level from it goes really, really fast, to it just makes the internet work like it should. That's what this is about. Um, when we talk to businesses, we got the same sort of response. You know, that speed, reliability, increasing productivity. So it's about, again, I want a reliable connection to my business so I can do my business. So I'm not dropping out and it actually continually delivers. So again, that's why we think the message that we want to start at the base level is not about the speed, but about the reliable, consistent delivery of the internet so you can do your business, you can do what you want, when you want, you don't have to wait for the little circle to keep going round and round and round, you know, uh, and really get annoyed. This was an interesting one, and I think this starts to, um, you know, when I talk to regions uh, in particular, becomes quite important. We ask businesses why, what's most appealing, of these concepts, what's most appealing for you? The most appealing concept, uh, or sorry, the first appealing concept that came up was online backup. It's funny how, particularly if you start talking to people who went through Christchurch, the Christchurch earthquake, this one's at the top of their list. There's a photo that I, People have heard me say this. I must try and find it. There's a, I remember seeing a photo of a lawyer walking out of the red zone before they closed it down with a desktop under his arm, the computer under the arm, because that's where all his client files were. He didn't have it backed up off-site. You know, if, he'd, if he hadn't got it out then and they closed the road, red zone, he was, well, as we say in the industry, literally screwed, right, because he didn't have anything. So online backup, a reliable upload speed, you know, is really, really important to people. And the second one that we found out of that is remote working. The ability to continue your business, whether you're on site at your business or at home or some other location has now become very important. So, and it's not only to do with disasters and earthquakes and floods and things like that, but it's actually, you know, people's lifestyles as well. And um, Catherine and I were talking about this morning, you know, we know people who want to live in towns such as Gisborne, Wanganui. In fact, when I was in Wanganui recently, I talked to a guy down there who'd come home from overseas, had continued his business, but was now based in Wanganui because he had a fibre connection. Why couldn't you do that in Gisborne? You could do the same thing. You know, I was talking to this young lady at Gisborne Net last, last night. We both live out of town. We both live at the beach because we both want to live at the beach. Um, I live in Oriwa, which is... At 6 o'clock in the morning, it's half an hour into the city centre of Auckland. At 8 o'clock, it's about 45 to 50 minutes into the centre of Auckland. She gets in from the beach in nine minutes to her office in the centre of Gisborne. Right? Once, and we're building UFB out where her house is as well. well I could almost do my job at her beach and have a nine-minute commute into the exchange and work here. You know, that's the sort of things that we can start to think about. There's another story of, um, we were talking about today, there's, um, I don't know if you heard about this UK company that's flying some of its staff out to Auckland for uh, three months at a time. They live in Auckland, they have a great experience, but they work during the day. They work in the house, they have an internet connection in the house, 
and basically it enables the UK company to have a call centre that operates 24 hours a day and not have to have people work at night. Because when they're asleep, New Zealand's open for business. Now they could be in Auckland, they could be in Gisborne. You know, it doesn't matter. UFB revolutionises broadband. We have to deliver this top line speed called 100 megabits per second. So if you're on copper at the moment, you'll get somewhere between five, maybe uh, in the middle of town you get between 10 and 20. If you buy our new VDSL product, you might get 20 to 40. But we have to deliver 100, at least be able to deliver 100 megabits per second. And if you're a geek, in our lab we've got running a gig at the moment over the same network. So we could actually pump out a thousand megabits per second to people if they wanted to buy it. It's to 75% of the population, 24 regions Chorus is building in, and Gisborne is one of those. And our priority is to reach schools, major health centres, and business centres by 2015. And we were in the uh, exchange yesterday afternoon watching one of the techs uh, do some fibre splicing, so that's lining, uh, you know, putting connection, putting this, the fibre together. And he was connecting, and I've forgotten the school's name again. Can you remember, Mike? The school that was being... Oh, Kaiti. Kaiti. Kaiti school was being connected up yesterday afternoon to fibre. So we were doing the, the jointing and the, and the exchange for their service. So there's Kaiti school is going to have the same fibre service as um, a school, Auckland Grammar. You know, same, same 100 megabits per second service as, say, Auckland Grammar can get from us as well. So it doesn't matter whether your school's in the middle of Auckland, the middle of Gisborne, in actual fact, for us, you could be the school in Wairau, or you could be up the Cape, and you're going to get the same quality connection that we're delivering anywhere in New Zealand. So that's one of the exciting things, and we'll come back to schools when I talk about rural. Um, I just want to run, I'll quickly run this video to show you, um, may not run it all the way, but this is an example of what's uh, being used for businesses. Matthew Lewis, I'm a graphic designer. I've been a graphic designer for a good 15 years. Ten of those years were spent in London. You know, the lifestyle draws you back here. It's very hard to forget it when you come from a place like Northland. I currently work I didn't have one for Gisborne, sorry. It's Northland, so. We have a large group of artists reside and work from this location. What's nice is to be able to live in a wonderful location like Northland, and to be able to have a world-class connectivity. I've been on fibre for over a year now. With its symmetric service, I find that I get at least 10 times faster upload speeds than I was getting on my previous copper connection. Um, the type of graphic design we do is generally for print production, um, but that also means that the file sizes are generally quite large, so transferring those files to the likes of a printer can be quite challenging. In the old style of copper network, the client would normally uh, be wanting to take their creative decision making right down to the wire, which means the deadline was passing us very quickly. You know, when the work really started, once I got sign off, my job had only just begun really. I needed to transfer these files over to a printer. You know, a, a typical 100 meg file could take 40, 60 minutes, and invariably it could fail at the last moment, which means it needed to be done again. But these days, we have a a local fibre network which has enabled us to uh, transfer files very quickly and very easily. It takes a lot of stress out of our day. It's probably increased our productivity by at least 30%. Before fibre, we used to have a lot of hold-ups, um, say, in regards to curing proofs. Um, Matt would also have to come around here and sign off proofs, so we would obviously wait for him. Every minute in this industry is, is a dollar wasted. You, you simply can't afford to be hanging around for couriers or, you know, getting in traffic and this sort of thing. And when we're holding up a press, that's that's a lot of money we're talking about. To do it via email, you know, is, is absolutely amazing because it's right then, it's instant, it's, it's brilliant. For us now, we're saving huge amounts of time. And of course, you're actually cutting down the cost of um, hard copy proofing. We went to Fiverr in 2011. That was right in the middle of a recession, of course. We were finding times pretty hard. Since having the Fiverr put in, we started to walk, run, and now we're galloping, basically. Um, our turnovers in 26 years of business have been the highest they've ever been. There's a lot of excitement about it, um, a lot of people talking about it, um, and it all helps to the local economy too, because people 
they can see something big's happening here. Longrow's the first, obviously, to really get the best out of this. And um, I think people are confident and very, very excited here about it. Well, because we've got more time on our hands now, um, I'd like to employ some more staff. I think that just enables us to be able to you know, take on more people because we can achieve more. Uh, we can have them you know, utilising the same network, which, which means that we're all working much faster and probably more importantly, a lot smarter. Uh, I know that's Northland, but that's an example of a, um, you know, a, a, a regional example of what's being done up there. Um, I had to have some uh, posters printed, and my events person had forgotten to do them, uh, which I found out yesterday morning. So she rang a Gisborne printer, talked to them on the phone yesterday. They swapped files because he had a fast connection, we had a fast connection. And uh, by the time I got here yesterday afternoon, I picked them up at 3 o'clock. So um, that's the sort of thing you can do just even from, from Auckland down to here. So let's talk about UFB and Gisborne, because everybody wants to know when it's coming to their place. Let me just say, we can't build everybody in one go, right? Sorry. This is what it's going to look like in Gisborne, and look, it's not, you can't really tell from here because it's just a picture, but there are, in the display areas, I've got some uh, maps that are up there that show some of the timings, and I'll sh tell you about a website that you should absolutely use, <laughs> that's assuming you have access to the internet, um, but you can get it from the library, you can go to the library and see it, um, when it's coming to your particular place. But you'll see that we're building out Wainui, which is where the uh, young lady I was talking to yesterday lives, on the beach, and through the CBD, um, the mayor last night was asking me how come we're not building up his way. And that, I said, will you go and talk to the government about that? Uh, <laughs> I like to pass those sorts of questions off to the other uh, government. Um, and you, but you'll see that um, you know, we are building quite a significant part of Gisborne right to people's home. I'm going to show you that video, it's boring. Um, what about in your house? People ask me, what's it going to look like in my place? So, again, I have a little video to show you what an installation actually looks like. That video took 90 seconds, but the action store was most of the day. So the thing I want to remind you about is this is a new network that we're putting in. And so we're going to have to dig up your front lawn and get it to your house. You can't, unless you've got ducting in already, you, you can't just use what's there at the moment. So this is a once in a generation um, upgrade or once in a generation implementation of a new network. So installing something into your house is actually going to be quite a disruptive process. Um, but we will work with you when you order it to get it in there. I would just say, and it's not, it's not in my slide pack, but um, we've set ourselves quite an ambitious target. We have to get past 840,000 premises by the end of 2019, which means we go past your front gate. We're setting ourselves a target of having at least a third of those 840,000 premises actually connected to the network by 2019. We think it's achievable, it's above the target that the government gave us, um, but we're going to need your help to actually meet that target. Of course, we'd obviously like it to be a lot higher, 
because of the benefits a new network brings to New Zealand. Just talk, roughly, quickly talk about RBI, because it's big in this area as well. So improving rural broadband. So what happens to the other 25% of New Zealand? So we have a contract to deliver what's called the schools commitment. So we're delivering fibre, the same fibre service, to 1,011 rural schools throughout New Zealand. There are only about 90 schools in New Zealand that won't get fibre. There is 12 or 13 in this area that won't get fibre, but they'll get a wireless solution, which I think has been contracted out to Gisborne.net. So um, that's how the government decided to do it. So very remote schools, only the last 90 very remote schools are getting a wireless solution. But the other 2,000, and I think there's about 2,300, 400 schools in New Zealand will all get fibre and they'll all get the same service, at the same speed, at the same cost. And just so it won't matter whether you're Potaka school, although I, someone told me it closed down. Um, or you're in the middle of Gisborne, you'll get the same service. And the other great thing in Gisborne um, that I would just like to mention, I mean, it's only four years ago that Telecom actually uh, brought fibre transmission to Gisborne. Before that, Gisborne was actually connected to the rest of the world by digital microwave radio, which had its limitations. So you didn't even have a decent backbone into Gisborne. But four years ago, Telecom brought a fibre uh, transmission cable up from Napier, so that one's in place. Um, and then we did a deal, and some, some of you might have been here last year, we did a deal with FX Network to co-jointly build around up the Cape. So we are um, working on that at the moment, and we're looking to get that live towards the end of the year, December. So when that goes live, Gisborne will have a redundant loop, a backhaul loop, out here, both north and south. It also enabled us to build to schools all up and around the Cape and deliver fibre services all the way around back down towards Whakatane, uh, Potiki and Whakatane. So that was a really good little story. And I think, you know, just from our perspective, a little story about how Chorus, you know, has changed its, uh, you know, is, is not the old Telecom. I don't mean that nastily. But, you know, we'll play with anybody. If we see financial sense and benefit in building something with somebody else, we'll do it. Um, and so in this case, we did it with FX. In fact, we got, they're building it because they've got the crews and they can do it quicker. So, um and we're just buying some fibres off them. So that's a really good little news story. This is what RBI looks like. Um, I think I took, the pack, I took the map out because, again, it's a bit tricky to figure out, you know, when's it coming, where's it coming? Um, and I'll show you the website to go to in a moment that tells you where we're upgrading. The important thing I want you to think about, though, is Chorus got the schools commitment. So we're delivering fibre to schools. We're upgrading some cabinets and we're delivering fibre to Vodafone, these new Vodafone rural broadband towers. Vodafone are the organisation that has the community coverage requirements. So they have to deliver a fixed wireless solution, five megabits or better, to 83% uh, of rural New Zealand. And then we're working with other providers such as Gisborne Net and other wireless providers to see how we can help them deliver to that other 7%. It's not an easy task. And you live in a particularly pretty part of the country but the Cape and those Uruweras and those mountains up there, it's not easy for us to get up there. It's actually very expensive and quite difficult. So um, we're looking for solutions and we're working with as many people as we can, but we're not going to get a solution today or tomorrow, I'm afraid. So what will you do? I want to finish off with that question to you. What will you do with this new cap capability? What will you do with being opened up to the world? And I will finish with another clip because these are interesting. I searched YouTube the other night for these things because you can find all sorts of things on YouTube. But this one particularly got to me. So we used a clip uh, in an, an original uh, presentation of a, of a choir, a virtual choir. Um, this clip tells you how that virtual choir was put together. So we'll watch it. So I then went into a studio and I conducted in total silence. And I could only hear
appeared in my head, and I loaded all of that up to YouTube, and I sent out a call to singers across the world, and the response was totally overwhelming. We had 185 singers from 12 different countries. It was all about connecting, and about somehow connecting with these people all over the world, and these individuals alone. When we did loops, then I think we really started getting it. So this time we're going to go back, do sleep for real, just the way I'd always imagined it would be. For me, singing together and making music together is, it's a fundamental human experience. And I love the idea that technology can bring people together from all over the world and still sort of participate in this, this transcendent experience. So that clip's on YouTube, you can look up Sleep Virtual Choir, and he has a hundred and whatever he said, singers throughout the world, no one actually meets together, they all sung it to their uh, webcam or their camera and uploaded it to his site and he created a virtual choir across the internet. So um, if you take that example and our digital art example, you know, there is nothing that we can't do once, you know, we've got this tool at our, at, at, um, once it's delivered and you can... Take it up. So my question to you is, what are you going to do with it? This is the website. chorus.co.nz forward slash maps. That's the website you want to keep an eye on. Everybody in New Zealand has an address point. You type your address in there. It tells you what services we can deliver now and what's coming and when it's coming. And I think that's my presentation. <laughs>